So good afternoon. My name is Michael Gizzi. I'm a professor at Illinois State University in Normal, Illinois, a couple hours south of Chicago. Uh, and um, this is the four stages of analysis made simple with Max Goudier. I am a political scientist who teaches criminal justice. I study law, constitutional law. And my work tends to focus on what I call the judicial impact of, of policy decisions. So uh, the American, the U.S. Supreme Court hands down a new decision. It establishes a new precedent. I look to see how lower courts interpret and comply with that new uh, precedent. That means I'm reading lots of complex legal documents. And I decided Max Goudier was the way to do this because it was a lot better than creating a spreadsheet with codes and then, and then uh, simply putting ones and zeros for documents, which is the way many political scientists do this sort of work. So I developed the four stages of research as a way of thinking through a qualitative slash mixed methods project. Uh, and the four stages are, are this. And we'll go through each of these, so I'll just show them quickly. And this was really from the original poster a year ago. The first stage, we're identifying the guiding questions that shape the study. Second stage, and again, we're going to, again, we'll come back to each of these. We're creating the workspace, we're finding our data, we're getting it into MaxQDA. We're beginning to develop a, a plan, a list of, of codes, of ideas that we know we're going to want to capture based on our literature review, which we're doing up here in, in the first step. We're coding documents in our third stage, and we're analyzing. Max QDA's tagline is the art of data analysis. I like that. Thematic analysis, I, I, I think, is, is, is the heart of this process. We're coding, but we're coding, and we're doing other things, and we're exploring. We're evaluating the data, and we're taking notes, memos. Uh, we're tracking what we're doing. And this process is, I like to say, emergent. Um, it's not linear. Well, coding is sort of linear. We read, we code, but sometimes we go back to other documents and say, oh, I missed that. Uh, and then ultimately, the last stage, which is also occurring up above, I'll stay here, is we're writing. We have final results, and we actually have to complete this project. So the first step, MaxUDA is a tool. It does not do the research for you. It's not automated. Um, it can make the research process much easier if you approach it in a systematic way and develop a conceptual framework for how to move forward. And for me, that's what this is about. The first stage of a research project is no different if it's quantitative or if it's qualitative. You have a topic. You have a question. That question needs to turn into a research question. There needs to be a thesis. There needs to be you know, a hypothesis. You have to do that kind of, that thing called the literature review. Now, you can do the literature review of Max QDA, but that's a different presentation. Okay, let's just say regardless of how you do the literature review, you need to do a literature review to identify what, what do we already know, all right? Once we have questions, once we know what we want to look at, we have the ability to then start thinking about, well, what's our workflow? What is our research space going to be? This is a digital workspace. This digital workspace is, we, we know what our questions are, what's our data? For me, my data tends to be judicial opinions. Fine, where do I get that? I gotta go to Lexis or I gotta go to Westlaw. I download the data, make sure they're in a format that I can use. Get rid of all the extraneous garbage that they like to download. I then import the documents. Now I'm creating, I create a project. I'm importing into Max QDA. Then I need to, okay, all right, so I got documents. Great. What do I do with them? How am I going to code them? Do I create a code book up front? I usually do. You might read through a document or two and paraphrase stuff, trying to figure out what you want to code. But I know from my literature review, what are the key issues at the beginning that I know I'm going to want to capture? So I create a list. I might categorize those. 
I might create a code that is a dummy code. And then I will have a bunch of codes underneath it for organization. Every project is going to be different. It's going to be different based on the type of data that you're looking at and you're using. Uh, so for example, I have a student, he's a great student. He is doing an independent study with me and he's interested in the jurisprudence or legal philosophy of Justice Antonin Scalia. Justice Scalia died a couple years ago. He was a leading proponent of a legal theory called originalism in terms of how to interpret the U.S. Constitution. And he did a literature review over the winter break. He read a, a couple of books, which for an undergrad, this was spectacular. <laughs> uh, uh, he identified a list of opinions. I sent him to other uh, data sets, and we found more opinions. He downloaded the full text of them all, and we put them into RTF. We dumped them into our project. But by itself, that document scheme there isn't particularly helpful because I don't know what the difference is between any of these, between any of these cases. What are they about? So we sat down together and we said, all right, let's use document groups. So our workflow is that there are three types of opinions. The opinion of the court, a majority opinion, a concurring opinion, a dissenting opinion. Those are the only three. Everything fits in one of those. So we divided them into there. But, but they're about different issues. So we created sets. Because the document can only be in one group. We created sets. And we copied all the 14th Amendment cases into a set. We could have a subset there if we wanted, but this is simple enough. Why? Well, we're doing this because we want to make it easier for him as he moves through the process. And so, in fact, when he's coding, he did all the 14th Amendment cases first. And now he's working through all the Fourth Amendment cases. This project's still in process. Since I've been in, in Berlin, I've seen my Dropbox telling me that David's working. <laughs> Strange <laughs> challenge. Um, we use document memos to keep general notes about each case. He had read two books over the break. He had notes on paper. He transferred those notes into a document one for each case. Valuable, a way of going to things. Writing a Kurt Graham in the master class yesterday, spent a lot of time talking about this. Writing does not happen at the end. It happens throughout your process. And I think that's essential. Uh, my other major project right now has 140 memos. There's a lot. It requires sorting stuff. We created an initial code book. We organized it topically, but the bulk of, that, of this study is all right here. Some of this he created before he coded anything. Some of this he was creating as he continued. We have a variety of other topics that, of things that we code that Sometimes they're just organizational. They help us. Uh, we want to know who agrees with him. And so he has lists of justices that he codes, which ultimately we can then just, like that, turn into variables. So the second stage gets us, you know, we're ready to do the work. Okay. The third stage, and to be honest, I believe that I'm going to be ch changing the third stage. The th third stage ultimately is going to be coding, and then the fourth stage is going to be thematic analysis and writing, because I think coding deserves more than I give it here. The more I think about it and working with students, and I work with two or three every semester, and, uh, and this is becoming a really valuable way. It's improving my process by working with them and making some uh, Teaching them how to code isn't hard, but teaching them how to code well requires doing more than just reading and dragging codes. But I think about the third stage is this way, all right? We're going to read through all the documents. We're going to code them. We're going to auto-code sometimes on key themes. In one of my projects, I had a variety of things. I want to see, did we capture the data? So I know I was interested in this concept. Did we actually capture it? So I did an autocode, and I and I saw I did a lexical search, and then I autocoded, and and then I had to sort through it to see 
Was it already there or not? We write memos as interesting points are revealed. We write more memos. We begin evaluating the data. We'll, we'll use descriptives to look for patterns. I want to know how many judges, how many opinions actually disagreed with the, the court. That's important in this project. So that's an inherently quantitative, very simple, low-level statistical thing. I need to count. I don't have to count manually. I can do it in SQDA. I can count codes, frequency codes. We use visual tools to look for interrelated concepts. We explore code segments. We go deeper and deeper and deeper. But you notice here, we evaluate da data. We sometimes find things we weren't looking for or weren't expecting emergent factors. And we go back, and we go back. I have another graphic which will really capture this, I think, better. But the content analysis is the heart of your research. Without the content analysis, you don't have anything. You, know, you might have some variables that you've coded, but you need to be able to make sure you've captured things. I like lexical searches, or a word search. Word search tool is valuable. Did we capture things? It's sometimes uh, valuable in the beginning to see, does this word actually show up a lot? And sometimes it's correcting. When you're dealing with complex documents, long legal technical documents, it's easy to sort of miss something. It's also easy to overcode. This is David's project. And what I noticed here he had, he had been working on the project for a week or two. He coded a bunch of stuff. And I'm like, God, there's a lot of codes here. A lot of numbers on the side. He was coding the same thing multiple times. And throughout the document, it was code, 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 code. It was a typical, I think, a, an understandable beginner mistake. The mistake was he wanted to capture everything. <coughs> the problem in that situation, though, is if you want to capture everything, you might have a heck of a time figuring out what you're actually, you know, what this means. But there are tools. Two weeks ago, a new tool emerged in Max QDA, the code map. So I clicked on it before he met with me. And I saw this. This was his study. And I'm looking at this, and I left this intentionally. There were two different codes here. So this is just a screenshot of it. Notice all these lines, super thick lines here from, from this, all going in the same place. He's still coding his, his data set. This suggested to me, I said, well, you've got two codes that look to be really similar. What do they mean? And we sat down, and he's like, well. And it wasn't clear that he had a... He had an analytical difference between the two. I said, well, why don't we get rid of one of them? Will that impact what you're doing? No, not really. And so we did. I don't know why this time it went in the other direction, but it did. <laughs> um, uh, again, it's only two weeks old, three weeks maybe. Um, now it's a lot cleaner. He's only, you know, halfway through coding his data set. So we're using visual tools in Max UDA while we're coding, looking to see, does this make sense? And, and so I, I think about this. These are, these are just valuable ways of, of moving forward. Again, I've talked about memo taking, but here's a, for example, memos are important. Again, I already mentioned the document memo. That's an example of, of one. Um, I tend to, I like to also uh, link codes with them. Although you, they're not part of the content analysis, but you can use them in the search tools. Um, that's a shame. I would love to see the, the memos be part of it in certain ways. But you can tie it to free memos. You can have coded segments. You can tie it to the code itself. I told David, you need to start having code memos so that we know exactly what is it, what is it that this means. Because I can't interpret what's in his head. But he's a good kid, so... <laughs> Here's an example of a memo that another student did. It's very simple, but so she's reading this here. It's about formal training, and she just made a comment. They're not allowed, this is about dogs. They're not allowed to fail in training, question mark. He was like, this is what the court said. 
You know, and this is something we'll come back to. It's like an intriguing little point. But you've gone through the process, you've coded everything. So I got, I got 60 documents all filled with codes and my code list shows me all these numbers. What then? What do I do then? How do I begin? Max QDA can appear to be overwhelming. And the reason it can appear to be overwhelming is because there's so many opportunities and so many tools. And I've come to the conclusion that the steps here, you need to figure out what works for you and realize that it's not one, two, three, four, or A, B, C, D. Okay? We're not going to be doing the exact same things at the exact same time. Everyone's going to be a lot, going to be different in how we do it. I probably use 20% of what MaxQDA has in a typical <coughs> project. And you might use a totally different 20%. Now we're all going to be retrieving segments and looking at stuff like that. This is where thinking through and trying to, where exploring is important. And for me, I think in the beginning, once I have everything coded, I literally just sit down and play. I'm going to run every little tool I can and see what the results are. I'm not tracking them. I'm not putting them in the logbook. I'm not, this is just an initial run through of the data. Why? Because I want to see if I can identify more patterns than what I already saw. I read 60 dog cases, the vast majority of which were were not at all critical of the precedent. I knew that because I knew there were only a handful of cases that were truly going to be significant for what I was doing. But did I see it all? So how do I make it more clear? So I play and I use certain, I use tools. So here's one of the ways I think we can think about thematic analysis. All right, this is in your handout. Notice here. This could go on forever. There may be no exit point in this graphic. Summarize your data. We have tools we can draw on. And the tools that we're drawing on might be different. This is not intended to be all in one, all inclusive. Code frequencies, descriptives, summary tables and grids, code configurations, code browser relations, query. Comparing groups, cross tabs, document set. But I'm summarizing data. I'm looking for patterns by using a variety of tools. I'm ultimately, in an, I'm aggregating or quantifying my results. I don't mean with statistical analysis. I mean figuring out what, what do I have here. Uh, I'm identifying examples. I'm re sometimes further refining the data, rereading my memos. Doing lexical searches on my memos to figure out what I took notes on. Uh, I'm creating summary memos, and I'll show that. I'm writing my analysis results. But it goes back and forth. It goes back and forth. It truly is an art. It's one that you get better at the more you do. And the key is just identifying some things that seem to work for you. Here's a word cloud from the dog study. This is a really nice looking word cloud, I gotta say. I spent a lot of time creating stop lists, dumping a lot of words that I didn't need. But, and to be honest, this word cloud is really pretty. Is it probably, is it gonna end up in the criminal justice journal I submit this to? Probably not. I could already hear the re reviewer number two. <laughs> but that's not its point. This helps me identify what? Documents that are words or concepts that appear a lot. But I can click on any of these words, like consent here, and poof. Now I get to see all of the examples where consent occurs. <coughs> And so I can see, and, and with my research, there's a lot of consistency in the types of words. And sometimes these examples, all right, I don't really need this. This is just really from the facts. 
he to ask Mr. Putney if he would consent to the canine sniff, to ask if he would consent. Okay, got it. I like interactive word trees. I find this valuable in my process. They look cool. Again, probably not going to end up in the final article. Not in what I'm doing. Um, but it gives me the ability to see when I, you know, this, the most basic thing here, dog sniff. This is all, every case is about dog sniffs. Okay, narcotic dog sniffs. But I can see how things fl flow. We well, have text that's already uh, highlighted because they're coded. But then I can change the words. This one took about 40 seconds to generate the first time because it's 60 long documents. But once you create it, it's, it's fast. So I said, all right, instead of dog sniff, I'm going to look for residual odor. <coughs> so I just take the word residual. Dogs alert on drugs and then don't find then they don't find drugs. And the cops say, well, that's because there was drugs there in the past. The dog is so good, he's detecting what was there. But it's not anymore. And so this provides me another way of looking at it. I'm thinking through this. There's all, so many other tools you could use. Keyword in context, it's one I like. I knew one of the words that the Supreme Court used was <coughs> that uh, f field performance was not the gold standard for, for measuring the reliability of a search. So show me the words where that appears in my documents on both sides, before and after. Uh, a, a map, code co-occurrence map. You know, I'm looking at my actual, what is that there, code? Oh, that's a retrieve segment for a code in the bottom left. Okay. These are all the types of things you're going to be doing. You have to figure out what works for you in terms of what's the best thing. Do you need to, does your project need a map? Maybe. Maybe not. Yesterday I was playing with maps and I took a code and it created a really nice graphic. It had the code and everything else that was interrelated to it with all the memos that were tied to it at the top. It was one of the easy ones. I didn't have to do anything. It was just a single code map. And it was like, wow, this is really useful. Um, again, will it end up in the writing? Maybe, maybe not. It might end up in a poster. Summary grids and tables. You can go through everything you've coded and you can summarize what's been coded and then view it in a nice table. That's a very valuable way of sort of conceptual, of breaking down stuff. I think a lot of the, the value of that depends on how many document, documents you have and how, how, how many codes you're looking at. Uh, I sometimes go, I guess you would call it old school. I structure findings and memos. I have a list of cases that I've identified based on codes that were critical of the precedent. There were like seven of them. I wrote down the names of each. I number my cases so they're easy to find. And then I take notes on it and I pull text and creating it. And then from there, I have the text that I can use in writing. I could turn this, by the way, this memo into a document and then create new codes and analyze my 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 findings that way. Here's something else I do. When I run something like a frequency table here in MaxQDA, it has the ability to copy it. And guess where I paste it? Right into a new memo. I haven't done this yet, but I'm gonna try it. I think I could probably also paste it right into the logbook. Assuming the logbook can take anything <coughs> that MaxQDA can take. I haven't done it before. The live book would, will be really useful once you're done with your initial playtime because then you can track what you've done so you have the ability to replicate. But ultimately, eventually, you have to put words down onto paper. And that's where that last stage finally comes in. You need to, you've coded your documents, you summarize your results, you have identified examples, you've found <coughs> patterns, you've run statistics. You got to put the pedal to the metal. You got to get that manuscript out because you want to get tenure. <laughs> or for me, you want to make sure you get the, the, the highest pay raise the next year. But you actually have to finish. You know, the idea of taking all your findings and then analyzing and coding them is good, except for the fact that it may never end. And so at some point, you need to actually write. You could write in MaxQDA. 
writing word, nicest, whatever, pages, I don't care, Google Docs, whatever, whatever you, whatever you want, wherever you write in. Um, but in the end there, you know, she had a topic, this is my student, this is her writing from this paper about expert witnesses, and, and she has examples from cases. That's what she's doing. She's drawing this based on her content analysis. The four stages are intended to provide you with a way of thinking. They're not intended to restrict you. They're intended to help you think through how to efficiently go through the pro process. Again, as I said in the beginning, it can get confusing. But if you start a project and thinking through, okay, I have to follow these certain steps, and then within these steps, I might go in a lot of different ways, I think it can be very valuable. I've been using this with students, a handful of students, the last couple of semesters, and I've been very, I've, I consider it to have been very successful so far. I, the link is in the handout, but I've built a much more comprehensive website and to, set of tutorials, uh, which explore the four stages. It's a work in progress. I'm creating tutorials about the things that work for me. And really, as I have a student who asks something and wants to know how to do something, I'm creating it. It's not recreating the wheel of the MaxQDA's excellent uh, support help set system uh, and website with tutorials. I link to their tutorials, but it's meant to provide a way. It doesn't have much on at the early stages yet. It's still in, in process, but it's a and it is Mac centric. You know, the Mac has the benefit of this uh, menu system that you PC users uh, miss out on. But you PC users can have multiple projects open at the same time. So, so I guess we each have benefits. Um, I encourage you, um, you know, to uh, to explore that. Ask me questions. Thank you very much.